Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. You're still live on The Pulse. Now, in our COVID-19 impact series today, like I said earlier, we're focusing on a 40-year-old woman who's struggling to fend for her two children after the pandemic caused her to lose her source of livelihood. It's one of the many life events militating against the empowerment and equal rights of women in Ghana. We have a conversation on this shortly. Officials of Shraj and the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative are joining us. First, though, Joy News' Annabella Onejan's report after visiting the 40-year-old widow to find out about the extreme techniques employed by her two sons, who are usually left with no option but to learn on an empty stomach. Her report is read to you. Nightfall is the best time for Theophilus Akuto to study. He's a final year student, readying himself for this year's BEC. But Theo has many hurdles to leap. Tonight, like many other nights, Theophilus and his brother would be going to bed with no food as he flips through his books. His legs are swallowed deep in the bucket of water. I asked him why. In school, my teacher once told me that when he was young, he normally do this to learn. If you're hungry, at least sometimes you're hungry, he forces you to sleep. So if I'm hungry, then I don't want to sleep. I just take the bowl of water and place my leg inside and take some water beside me and start drinking. He lives in an uncompleted building at Agape Town in Ablekuma, one of Accra's sprawling suburbs with his family. He falls asleep because of anger by 7.30 or 6 o'clock, and he's asleep. So I want him to learn, so I take him through these measures, and so I, we learn together. His mother, Mami Efua Taylor, a 40-year-old widow, has been without work for the last eight years. Before COVID-19, she was fetching water for building construction site. When the pandemic hit, many of the sites stopped working. She was left hanging. My mother is dead. My father is dead. My husband too is dead. Taking care of the children is tough. If I had my way, I could go to bed with no food, but I worry about the children, their school and upbringing. As if all these are not enough, Mami has to deal with hernia condition that her son has lived with for 13 years now. A peninsula problem, to say hernia problem. My son has hernia. I think about it every day. I have blood pressure and I worry a lot. Sometimes I am tempted to poison myself and poison the kids too. I mean poison I want to go forward. So I take my education serious by doing this procedure so I will not fall asleep and learn frequently the time. In the near future, I'll pass my business and go to the next stage. A civil engineer. I see my strength in it. I'm good in math and science. Theophilus and his mother are not sure what tomorrow holds or where help will come from. And as his exam is only a month away, he and his family continue to live in fear and uncertainty. The eyes of that young man seem to be piercing into my soul, I tell you. Very heartbreaking story there. Mina Mensah, Director at Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, CHRI Africa Office in Marinati, Greater Accra Regional um, Director of SHRAJ, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, are uh, our guests this afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Daniel. Now, this has been exposed by COVID, but I mean, we're just having a conversation about how the real conversation about is about inequality and how disadvantaged popul the disadvantaged population in Ghana has been exposed by, by, this, by this pandemic. Um, let me begin with you. Thank you, know. you, Daniel, for this opportunity. You've hit the nail right on the head. Some of these things have been happening for so long, forever. 
So society has taken it as one of those things that happen. But you see, um, the state owes its citizens a certain obligation. And um, Ghana has signed onto quite a number of instruments which requires that there are structures in place to take care of the citizenry and the vulnerable, especially women and children, when um, things like this happen. Even when things like this have not happened, there ought to be structures in place to take care of um, women and children. Unfortunately, we cannot say that things are functioning in Ghana. We do have um, the social welfare department, but that's just it. It is so under-resourced that nothing much is happening there. The Ministry of Gender, um, Children and Social Protection is there, but what kind of programs do they mm -hmm. have in place? Mm -hmm. And in any case, even if they have the programs, do we have the data mm. to follow up on such um, people? So because of that, and because of the fact that a lot of women are not able to participate in um, the social enterprises okay. because of education. A lot of women have lower levels of education. When you look at the statistics, I think it's 2.5% more for males mm. than women. So you find uh, the number of women in professions or professional lives mm. lower. So if you're not financially um, equipped, when things like this happen to you, on top of the emotional stress that you have, you're also thinking about money. So this is right. quite rampant. Unfortunately, COVID has made it so obvious and so in your face. Mm. Because, I mean, with COVID, imagine you've lost your job. You can't go out to sell because of the social distancing. Now, at least it's a bit better. What do you do? You have children to feed. I think that um, these are some of the challenges that um, we are facing as a country. Okay. I know someone would say that it's worldwide, but I think that for, uh, for us in Africa, and Ghana in particular, it's even worse because the structures just do not exist. L let me come to you, Mary. Now, Ghana is, the, from what I understand, the first country to sign, for instance, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, back in 1990. Mm -hmm. And the protection of vulnerable like children is also what we are talking about. Unfortunately, we, we are not fully complying with it. After 30 good years, what are the real roadblocks in there? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, signing onto a document is not just the uh, most important thing. It is important, but then there has to be structures on the ground to implement what the law actually says. And yes, the law was passed in Ghana uh, at uh, 520 mm -hmm. in respect of that uh, treaty that was signed. And then the uh, uh, gender ministry to support women and, and children. However, you realize that there are certain things that must be done. There are policies on the ground, I must say, to support mm -hmm. family and others, but it is not actually working properly, okay. I must say. Why? The laws are there, but the enforcement of the laws is another. Why? Because the state, which is the primary actor of the standards, principles, and then the guarantees of human rights, is supposed to, you know, how do I put it? Have a rights-based approach to some of these things. Once you have signed onto a document, you must ensure you must ensure that you put structures, you volunteer money, you set money aside to implement. Mm. And so, fine. Some people will say that over the years, children have been catered for in terms of education and all. But COVID-19 has revealed a lot of you know hardship in the system, and mm. therefore. The gender ministry must be resourced to take care of, especially women, women who are in, in, in this area yeah. a, a bit below the belt, because most women are in the informal sector. And now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just scanning through some of the numbers, I mean, that I, that I can pick up. Um, in 2017, 72.6 um, billion, 72 million was allocated for child protection only 33.1% was disbursed. And, and this, will, this will interest you. Like, like Mary said, we've signed a lot of things. We've adopted the Child and Family Welfare Policy, the Justice for Children Policy, the National Gender Policy, the five-year strategic plan to help prevent adolescent pregnancies, Ghana Family Planning Costing Implementation, that's five, 
the National Strategic Framework on Ending Child Marriage. And th so that's six different things we have said we would do. None of them have been implemented fully. Are we serious about social protection in Ghana? Daniel, uh, we are not serious about a lot of things. And I think that our priorities also uh, need to be looked at. As a country, um, we tend to prioritize things that um, in other developing, in the developed world, are not priorities. And so when we look at the child, and we look at the policies that we put in place, generally we have lovely laws, lovely policies. In this country, if you're talking about the laws, quite a number of them are good. But the implementation, and sometimes it is the political will. Unfortunately, we live in a society where people um, are not, very well educated on their rights. It's not about just being academically educated. It's being educated on your rights, being self-aware that the state owes me this and that I should put pressure on the state to ensure that my rights are respected and the things that the state has to do for me, it is done. Mm -hmm. And then we, we are very well mm -hmm. steeped in culture, which means that we need to be able to educate individuals mm -hmm. a lot to move from certain cultural practices that hinder even the state to be able to ensure that some of the laws are implemented. And let's look at the What are some of these cultural practices? Some of these cultural practices, um, let me give you a very basic one. Uh, looking at the child, for instance. In certain places, we put more emphasis on the boy than the girl. Mm. It is coming down, yes, we are promoting girl-child education. More girls are going to school, but what is the percentage? Mm. So obviously, if you have a home where there's a boy and a girl, and you are not, you've not been educated to that level, and you still think like that, you would educate your boy-child. Your girl-child might not get the same education. And in times like this, when the person might not have the necessary work that she's supposed to have, or the way without, then she has children. She has to look after the children. And what is the foundation? The foundation is because of the way she was socialized, the traditional practice where that they put value, more value on the male than the female. Right. And that is a bit difficult to do. Right. Now, um, because we cover a lot of politics on this platform, I think we've come to understand, and, and I was just taking a cursory glance at the latest Afrobarometer report, important problems for Ghanaian young people. Unemployment, education, infrastructure, health, water supply, economy, crime, and security, and it goes on and on and on. There's nothing specifically about social protection, mm -hmm. but it is one of our biggest problems because 45% of our population, according to the GSS, is multidimensionally poor. I learned that on the post just a few days ago. How do we paint the picture that catering for these 13.5 million people is actually solving the problems that? matter to Ghanaians like unemployment, health, and what have you. How, how do we make it clear, Mary? It's setting our priorities right. You know, if one person, someone will say, if you have several children to cater for and there are various needs, it's important to identify which particular need is more important and necessary. Again, like we said, strong institutions is what will also help as direct the need of society and the need of Ghanaians, especially the youth, as you just mentioned. It's not just institution, but strong institution. How do we get strong institutions to you know, champion the cause of our citizenry? It's very important. More importantly, the institutions are there. However, they are not resourced in order to be able to you know, do the necessary work they're supposed to do to achieve the maximum uh, effect. Mm. It's very, very important. For instance, look at the social welfare. We, suppose, we don't have any welfare system, but we have a social welfare institution. And that institution is not functioning properly because they are under-resourced. You let a child be brought to Shraj, roaming in the streets, mm. and we're looking for shelter for such a child. It's mm. very difficult at times to even get a place for that child at social welfare. Sometimes we have to rely on NGOs and other stakeholders because, of course, human rights uh, 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 achievement or realization is not just 
the, uh, the role of the okay. state, but there are other stakeholders okay. who also help to okay. achieve that. Interesting. So um, I'll come back to you, Mina, because, um, so yes, we understand that, like you said, there's a lack of political will. Mm. The only thing politicians understand is a citizen's demand, a citizen's vote. But the citizens, from this data I'm reading to you, do not appreciate these issues either, whether they're in the middle class or they are underprivileged themselves. So I'm bringing back that question to you. How do we marry the two? How do we help people understand that social welfare and social protection is also about your health care, and it's also about your jobs, it's also about your education? How, how do we do that? You know? Daniel, you see, an informed population huh? is a wealthy population. It's just because people do, are not informed. Do people really understand social protection in the first place? Do people connect that to their personal well-being? So talking about institution, the institution that is supposed to educate you mostly on that is the NCCE. Let's look at the NCCE. I mean, their budget and everything. So, and then our socialization. You see, we, 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 we in the olden days, it was a community thing. One, somebody looks after the other and stuff. Things are changing. Things are different. It's more of each one for himself, God for us all. Unfortunately, whilst we are doing that, we are not educating the citizenry to be, say that, fine, we are in a different kind of governance structure. The responsibility is on government to ensure that, because you do have a social contract with the states. That is why we pay taxes. Mm. So it is the responsibility of the state to empower the citizens to demand. The state is not doing that. The citizenry in recent times is so polarized that if somebody is even going to do the education, they just start tagging. It's because this person, or put a demand, it's because this person is for party A, and that, that's why the person is asking for that. So for me, it's lack of information and lack of understanding. And the third thing is a very apathetic society. Um, Ghanaians are laid back, and sometimes we are laid back to the point of being apathetic, thinking that the ruling class owes us something. We don't have that, um, um, we don't understand that the power is actually ours, and it is our right to demand that they do things that favor us. And it's because we do not have information. But politicians tell us what they want to tell us, not necessarily what we want to know and what will benefit us. So you look at the information out there, and how many times do you hear any state official coming out to say that, Oh, government is responsible to do. It's only during this COVID era that we hear the government is responsible for certain things. But on the whole, how many times do, does any, any official come out to say that the state um, owes you A, B, C, D? So it's your right to demand that. And okay. unfortunately, civil society is, is a partner in this. But how much can civil society do? Especially when sometimes, instead of the state seeing civil society as a partner, the state sees, civil, sees it like we are doing civil society a favor, or the um, NGOs a favor, by allowing them to be on our platforms or giving them the information that they need to help us educate the citizens. So they make it difficult for civil society operations? Yes, they don't even involve you. So mm -hmm. you need to do a lot of guesswork, walking around, trying to beg for information, trying to, you know, cajole people to be part of things that ordinarily, if the space is opened for civil society to help, it will make it easier. So civil society is helping, but we are helping it in, the environment is not really unfriendly, 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 mm. but it's more like indifferent, kind mm. of. Now, STRAD is one of the institutions that we want to strengthen. Let, let's, let's be frank here. How much I has like come your to your office? you want to strengthen. <laughs> <laughs> How much has come to your office this, this year? Oh, let me, uh, frankly speaking, I can't give figures, but um, over the short period, our uh, budget has received some uh, much attention. Though there's more room for improvement, I must say, but it hasn't been that, it's been a bit encouraging, I must say, but not to what we expect, because there's a lot to be done, a shrage. How many like people do you have in your office? In my office. Yes, in the Greater Accra region. Oh, the Greater Accra, we have 45. 45 offices. Yes. 
And what is the case to like what's an average day like for an officer? What I are you supposed to do? An average day like you coming, you expect to receive a complaint, you expect to go out and do public education like uh, Mina just said, sensitize the people on their rights. You expect to attend to clients who are walking in to follow up on their cases. You expect to do your report and attend to uh, other stakeholders. So there's a lot we do there. And, and I'm just imagining the, the population, Mina, the population of the Greater Accra region. Mm -hmm. Our voter population alone is 3.5 million. On the last no, we exercise. have the regional, we have the head office, and we also have the, the regional, and we so, have district offices all across. For all across. That's why I wanted to know the number of office, officers that we have that are in charge of the Greater Accra region. Alone. The 3.5 million of us, yes. <laughs> and like I'm saying, the Greater Accra region is not responsible are, for the whole 3.5. So, so there we are have the regional, offices. the head office, which has a lot of officers. And there are district offices as well. Exactly. Offices as well. I'm also to out, serve I'm people at the district office. level. I'm, I'll take out head office because the head office is for Ghana, not for Exactly. Ghana. But they also have control in Greater Accra. Right, right, yes. right. But I think the picture is really clear that there's a lot that must be done. Oh, yes. Like we say, getting more uh, officers on board will, will not be a bad idea at all. We still need, we are doing, still employing people because we need more people to join the fold for us to do the work. But we also must say that we need the media to help. We are the fourth estate of the arm of government. It's very important that the media partner with institutions like us, like that of MENA, because you realize that uh, the media are supposed to, to follow up on agendas of the state and also report. And like I said, everything we do these days should be right based up approach if the media will focus that we are following th this program because it affects the rights and the, uh, the rights and the freedom of other people or of the vulnerable of women mm. it's a it's a project inequality and we want to follow up on it and see what the state is doing sometimes the, the role of the media may put the state on its toes to do that which is expected which is why we are here now exactly to, and we to, thank to you for the opportunity but more be must done. be done it's very, very important because... Okay. What is there? I, I just want a quick final word from both, from both ladies. I mean, at beginning with you, the state must do something. From the trend that we have seen, it is not doing it. There's no hiding behind it from both administrations. What can we do? What can be done immediately? Mm. Immediately, what can be done is for the citizens to rise up for the media to be at the forefront of um, the education. Because like uh, Mary said, and I said, an informed population is a wealthy population. It's only when the people are informed as to um, what their rights are, what their benefits are, what they stand to gain if they involve themselves and demand for the right thing to be done, the right uh, opportunities to be given them, the right uh, things to be looked at. Let's look at this affirmative action law. As far back as 1990-something, mm -hmm. this um, F F F the f first policy came up. Mm -hmm. And we've been toying with this thing for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is because as much as people are demanding, women are demanding, and at the level of the grassroots, how many women are rising up and are demanding this? And it has become a women thing mm -hmm. instead of a Ghana thing. And that is where the challenge is. Because you see, for our male folks, if you have a woman who is empowered, it makes life easier on you. Right. Because you bring 10 CDs, I bring 10 CDs. Right. We have very empowered women at the back telling me <laughs> to, to close. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, the affirmative action uh, uh, bill was introduced in 1998. Yes. I to check that. And again, we are calling on citizens. You see, the law in, in, in UK developed. Because citizens were very active and assertive. They knew what was in the law, their rights and their freedoms. And they had to go to the courts to enforce. Okay. So we are calling on citizenry to be up and coming, to be active, and to join forces to ensure that certain things, injustices in the system are done away with by being right. assertive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much. Mina. Um, you are still live on the pause. I've been speaking with Mina Mensa, Director, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, CHRI Africa Office, and Mary Nati, Greater Aquarius Regional Director of SHRAJ.
Let's stay live on the pulse. We'll be right back because um, for about two hours, six independent presidential hopefuls responded to issues on corruption, education, health, and many others, including sanitation. That's coming up. We'll be telling you exactly what they demanded in just a few minutes. Stay with us.